Hi, this is Sean Perrin, and you're listening to episode 24 of the Clarinet Podcast with Phil Lambert of Classical Fingers. This episode is brought to you by Daddario Woodwinds. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, Daddario is redefining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with technology built from the ground up. By using the world's most innovative techniques to deliver consistently what was once made variable by hand, Daddario ensures excellence right out of the box as standard, not a surprise. So you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from Daddario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com slash woodwinds. Hi everyone, and thanks so much for listening to the Clarinet Podcast. For those who are new here, I want to invite you to check out not only some of the older episodes, there's now 23 additional episodes other than this one, which is just really just amazing. Um, We have past interviews with great artists like Michael Norsworthy, Martin Frost, Laurie Friedman, Evan Zaporin, there's getting to be a really huge list, Harry Sparnai. Um, also we have some great manufacturers that we've talked to, including Leger Reeds. They talk about their synthetic reed products, Edimotic Research, who discusses hearing protection for musicians and, uh, many other companies. So check the back catalog. If you're using iTunes, you can just click on the feed button and it will send you over to show you all the past episodes, not just the, the brand new ones. Um, if you're on the website, just scroll down and there's three solid pages of, of uh, episodes you can you can now listen to. If, on the other hand, you've been around for a while, but you've just been listening to the podcast and haven't really checked out the website, there's never been a time a better time to do so. I've recently started a blog on there, and what that is doing is it's basically content that, to me, doesn't really warrant an entire podcast episode. For example, I'll discuss the 10 tips for marching clarinetists. There's also some some pictures up there that are rather funny that I found. And uh, of course, I cannot display pictures on a podcast. So that is sort of a better medium for that. So if you have only been listening, I'd encourage you to head over to clarinet.com, check that out, and uh, hopefully you enjoy what you find. Um, one more thing is that uh, the next episode, I'm going to try something a little bit different. I, I realized actually just before making this episode today that this is the 24th episode. This is exactly halfway through the year. If I think about the fact that my goal was to produce four episodes a month for 12 months. So this is the exact halfway point. And I'm so happy that we've gotten here. And there's been so many changes and uh, some great people coming up. I just want to dedicate an entire episode to talk about some of the stats, some of the changes, some of the things that are coming, and what to look for in the future of Clarinet. Also, I really look forward to seeing everybody who's going to be at Clarinet Fest 2016 in in Kansas. Um, I'm going to be going there, but before that, they say two is company and three is a crowd. So if two cities is a vacation or a trip, then maybe three is a tour. I'm I'm kind of calling it the Clarinet Tour. I'm going to be going to uh, Montreal, and there I'm going to have the chance to speak with Lori Friedman and uh, do a couple other things, including going to the Radiohead concert, which I'm just super excited about. I don't know if any other clarinet players are Radio, Radiohead fans, but uh, I definitely am, and it's going to be an amazing show. Um, after that, I'm heading straight to Kansas for the Clarinet Fest. And then after returning home for a few days, I'm going to head out to Vancouver and check out the Bakun Musical Services facility and conduct an interview live on location out there. Um, really excited about all that. It's going to be a great summer. And I, I do look forward to, like I said, everybody at Clarinet Fest. Please come up, say hi. Um, if you don't get a chance to come up and say hi, I will have some pamphlets available at the Diderio booth. They've been so kind as to offer some space for the Clarinet pamphlets to be picked up by the public there. So please go ahead and do that. And uh, it's going to be great. Today's guest is Phil Lambert, who was born in Christchurch, New Zealand. After completing his music degree, he relocated to Melbourne, Australia, where he continued his musical career as a composer, teacher, and performer, and established his own company called Cloudbreak Music. Phil has now composed for feature films, film trailers, short films, media projects, and TVCs, performed live at various venues, radio stations, and even made an appearance on TV. As well, he has received radio play for his compositions, along with interviews throughout Australia and New Zealand. He also built a successful private woodman teaching business and created the internationally recognized product, Classical Fingers. 
As a music educator, Phil has been teaching clarinet, saxophone, and flute for 18 years and now teaches privately from his studio in Kensington, Melbourne. Phil believes that private tuition is important as it not only establishes a bond between teacher and student, but allows him to personally focus solely on each student's needs at the particular level that they are at. Phil says, Every student is different, so every lesson needs to be tailored to suit their ability and potential. During Phil's years of teaching woodwind, he encountered numerous players, both beginners and advanced, that naturally played the clarinet by lifting their fingers too high, so he started experimenting with the idea of using a device to help reduce this movement. In 2011, Phil started developing a prototype that his students could use on a more regular basis, away from the lesson even, and in 2014, the evolution of Classical Fingers was finally realized. Since its release, Classical Fingers has been sold to over 28 countries. Its main customers have been students, teachers, stores, universities, high schools, and distributors. It has also won various design awards and has been exhibited in Australia, Korea, and the USA. Phil is currently developing Classical Fingers for the flute. In this episode, we discuss not only Phil's career and, and how he manages to be so diverse, but we also discuss his product Classical Fingers at length, including how it can be used by both teachers and students as an innovative teaching tool. The giveaway for today's episode is one Classical Fingers product mailed anywhere in the world free of charge. To make sure you're eligible to win items mentioned on the podcast, please subscribe to the mailing list at www.clarineat.com slash giveaways. That's www.clarineat.com slash giveaways. And now it's time for the interview with Phil Lambert. The music you're about to hear was composed by Phil and was used in a television advertisement. Welcome to the clarinet.com podcast. I'm so happy to have you on the show today to discuss your product, Classical Fingers. Thanks, Sean. I really appreciate being here. Yeah, this is actually, I think you're the furthest guest we've ever had here. You're over in Australia right now. And anyways, we're here today to talk about your product called Classical Fingers. Um, but before we do that, I'd really like to get to know you a little bit better. Um, in addition to this product, you're also a successful teacher, performer, and composer of a wide array of music, including film scores. That's a pretty impressive roster of things on the go. How did you become so diverse? Um, well, basically, when I started, I started clarinet when I was uh, about 11 years old, I think, and um, won a scholarship to my high school, um, cl carried on playing clarinet. And as I um, proceeded through uh, high school, I, I developed pretty bad RSI in my hands while I was playing clarinet. Um, Is I that, was uh, re re repetitive stress ab problems. Absolutely, yeah, pretty pretty oh, okay. bad, and that will tie into why I did classical fingers eventually. But um, I had a decision to make <clears throat> at school whether or not to pursue professional playing um, or something else related to music. And I started doing composition at school and decided, hey, this is quite a good area for what I want to do. Instead of playing other people's music, I thought, what a great idea to actually create my own music. So carried on and did my um, um, studies at university with that. And then I moved to Australia from New Zealand and carried on uh, pursuing writing music. So I was also in bands. I was a solo artist, so we, we created sort of pop songs, etc., like that. And then I slowly <clears throat> worked my way into film music and doing jingles, corporate projects, short films, etc., cetera, um, with what I'm doing with my composing, um, which has been a lot of fun and being able to be quite creative with creating music is um, a big passion of mine. And I like the idea of creating something that doesn't exist, you know, so that, that sort of fits into my personality, I think. Yeah. You know, without, I suppose, people writing music, people can't play music. So, you know, it's a symbiotic relationship and I'm all for supporting that and pushing that forward. So absolutely. 
what are your thoughts on, you know, having a, an actual business to run your composition through? I mean, I think that so many people in the past used to just write music and sort of hope it got somewhere, but mm. people are treating it like a real business these days. What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts on that would be, so obviously at university or educational levels, you get taught how to write music, etc. cetera. Um, and away from that, I think you can be the most talented composer out there but if you don't have some kind of business plan of pushing yourself as a composer, uh, you could possibly just be writing music in your own studio at home and not really getting it out there. So you've got to be kind of a, a personable person as such and, and, and to get on with people, you know, and that, that's really important, especially in, in, in the film industry. You know, if I can if I can meet somebody and you know show that okay, I can write music. Hopefully, I keep practicing. You know, I can always improve, of course. Um, but if you can get across that, you know, you're there to support them and you can work together and, and support their visuals as a composer. I think that's part of that business business model that I base my composing on, as well as you know dealing with licensing synchronizing with the film etc like that so i think it's a very very important 50 50 relationship with composing and the business side and uh, i i enjoy the business side um as well as the composing side um because there's nothing worse than writing a lot of music and not not having it out there so you know it's a hard road it makes me think about that old that old uh figure of speech or whatever where they mentioned that the tree in the forest falling if no one's there does anyone hear it you, you know that <laughs> absolutely you know, if, if a composer writes by himself yeah. and no one's here his piece did he really compose like how to... <laughs> absolutely and yeah you go through quite a few years believing that and I, I think i still do sometimes you know you're writing a piece of music i'm writing an orchestral piece at the moment trying to diversify into I suppose not just doing film music, but trying to get it uh, performed by a, an orchestra. And I've also got a string quartet I'm working on. Um, but as you said, am I composing it? Can I prove I'm composing it unless somebody plays it? You know. <laughs> <laughs> but the, 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 the great world we live in is you can have these great virtual instruments now. So a lot of films, for example, are not just live orchestras now depending on the budget of the film so obviously if you've got a film with a 30 million dollar budget you can write uh, an orchestral piece and get it performed by a real orchestra um uh, but most of the times they are putting it through the um the virtual world with the instruments and they sound incredibly real so i've got software that say danny elfman might use um etc etc so you know it, it's sitting there looking pretty real and when you when you mix it in with with the actual visuals of a film and the sound design of a film it, it sounds pretty realistic and um yeah so that's the way it's going at the moment so it's pretty exciting i want to be careful with that laugh subject don't want to open up a can of worms here but yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah exactly. i know that's fairly controversial you know yeah 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 but, no. uh, but it, it gets dictated by the by the budget of films yeah so if you want to see a film and and you want that music to be played yeah an an orchestra for example if it's fifty thousand dollars just for a day of recording so what brought you from new zealand to australia so i was it the opportunity uh to carry on music new New zealand's a a fantastic place to live um great people um the environmental factors are amazing over there um in fact my parents moved there from england they had a choice between Canada and New Zealand. And um, so you might relate to that. It's a very similar kind of feel of a place, you know. So um, mm. came from New Zealand. I, um, but as far as opportunities and, and writing music, et cetera, and teaching and, and running a few things, uh, Australia was the closest place. So it's a three-and-a-half-hour flight west of New Zealand. Um, I, I had known some people who had run some businesses in Australia. So for me, it was quite an easy transition very similar kind of place um and and people and very livable so i moved to melbourne and and carried on um playing in my band at the time and um from there i started the teaching um the teaching business that i still run now um and composing etc so yeah that's why i moved more opportunity i guess let's let's get to your product now then so you, you were at the nam show this year um Classical Fingers is an award-winning product designed and manufactured in Australia. Is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. I I was very um, 
how do I say, determined to make this an Australian product all the way. I, I don't mm-hmm. I don't want to go offshore and go to China, et cetera, just to save some dollars. I have better quality control if, I, if I'm developing it within um, Australia. So the engineers, the designers, the, the manufacturing company is all Australian-based, so... And, and so it's all made here. So I have complete quality control over over my product. So for those listening, the Classical Fingers is a device that's designed to sort of fix this age-old problem of students lifting their fingers way, way too high. And uh, basically, it's a plastic shield that goes over top of the instrument in a very unique shape and uh, is held it on by really strong magnets. Um, the product is shipped in a really, really nice box, really fantastic quality here and it comes with a nice uh, carrying bag and uh, I believe it's available now from several distributors around the world so h- how is it manufactured then what's the story and what's the story behind the product how did you come up with it the story behind the product so I've been teaching uh, for oh wow it must be about 18 years now so I started when I was 18 um, teaching and I always noticed as a as an issue for for students um, that their fingers would go quite high off the clarinet. Obviously, as a teacher, I I thought, okay, well, you know, over time, and a lot of teachers most likely believe this, over time they'll come down, which is certainly degree it, that's true. Um, so I can concentrate on embouchure, other techniques, dynamics, tonguing, etc., reading music, for example, you know, all the basics, etc. Um, but after uh, 10 years of teaching, I, I thought, well, there's got to be a better way for doing this. You know, I was putting a pencil above my students' fingers. I was putting a ruler above their fingers. I was telling them nonstop every lesson, watch out for your fingers, watch out for your fingers. Even if some fingers got better, their little fingers would, would, would stick up too high. And, and, I, and I noticed that, well, as soon as that starts happening, they are less likely to... A, play quicker, especially in the early days. And also when they're placing their fingers down on the clarinet, they're missing the holes. So they're not, they're not playing efficiently, efficiently on the clarinet and getting the correct sound out of the clarinet. You can, have all the, you can have the best embouchure in the world. You can have the best tonguing in the world. You can understand the performing side. You can understand the musicality. You can understand your theory of music. But if your fingers essentially are not coming down on those holes, in the correct place well there's a huge issue and that's a huge fundamental issue and a lot of my students and a lot of other teachers students always had this issue with their fingering placement if, if, if you grab uh, have a brand new student 10 year old student come along and start playing clarinet the chances are they will struggle to hold the clarinet their fingers will be incredibly high off the clarinet. This is not good for your hand anyway over time. So then they resort to, okay, let's get a neck strap. And even then their fingers aren't positioned properly. So this device, this classical fingers came about because of all these issues. And of course, I'm passionate about music. I'm passionate about teaching. I'm passionate about students. Um, I want to um, create the easiest possible way for students to learn without saying, well, just practice 20 hours a week, you'll be fine. But, you know, we want to encourage people playing clarinet. There's a lot of people who start clarinet, they give up clarinet, you know, because they say it squeaks a lot. Um, it's a very difficult instrument to play. For example, if you play saxophone, you know, they can slam their fingers down, they can get a sound, they can do some things on the saxophone. I'm not saying the technique's correct with doing that, but the clarinet's a particularly hard instrument to start playing. So part of it is to encourage people to learn the clarinet to improve on the clarinet and to carry on playing the clarinet. As, as a teacher myself, the, the, the purpose of my teaching is to say, okay, one day you will go off by yourself, play the clarinet and enjoy the level you got to on the clarinet. And it can be a fantastic hobby, great escapism from stresses of life. And you can really enjoy music and get appreciation for it. So I started coming up with the guard. And, and I, I came up with some DAS clay models and I tested it on my students to see if, okay, let's see if this really could work as a theory. And, and it, the results were absolutely amazing. It really blew me away. Uh, as soon as I put this homemade device on the clarinet of my students, their fingers came down straight away. I put it on for five minutes only and then I took it off. 
this is just my homemade one when I was just trying out the development. And straight mm-hmm. away, their fingers were lower because they felt like it was still there. So for me, that was a huge achievement of presenting a product, potentially making the product into a commercial product, even at this early stage, was that, well, it's even acting as a deterrent. It's not there just to be so strict on your fingers. It, it's creating an awareness for this issue. So that was huge. So went down to designers, et cetera, et cetera, and it took me three years to develop classical fingers before it was finally made. Wow. Mm. It's funny you mentioned the homemade products because I think a lot of people have tried with, you know, coat hangers and various things. <laughs> yeah, I get that uh, on um, the internet a few times. Chucking well, I had a... liars and put a metal <laughs> strut across the top. <laughs> yeah, yeah, people can be pretty creative. I mean, obviously, but I, I had a student a while ago who, with this problem, I mean, I joked about the coat hanger, but the next <laughs> lesson I, I came and he'd taken it to the next level by attaching actually a D battery to it. He was trying to shock himself. And oh, wow. I was like, I was like, oh my God, you're, you're, you're going to be an engineer, but let's stop this right now. I don't, I don't like where this is going. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I've had people say that to me. They say, oh, you know, it's working well. It's great. Have you tried to put electrodes, electro, um, making an electric? And I said, that'd be fantastic, but I don't think the legalities would go down too well with that. Are you that. serious? People have asked for that? Yeah, they've actually said that would be really cool. Just give them a little shock. I think they're joking, though. But um, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. so the product itself is very light. I'm assuming that went into the design. What else did you sort of consider? There's sort Absol- of a curved shape. It, it's yeah, sort of a... Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the curve shape, so... Uh, with the, some of the awards, it's one um, particular note was that it looks like a treble cliff. So I was trying to keep it musical. Um, I love the clarinet. Um, us people who play the clarinet, uh, yeah, we're quite fussy, fussy lot. You know, we don't, we're quite particular about our instruments, etc. So I thought, well, let's try to come up with a product that, okay, functionality, yes, it works, it keeps the fingers low. Um, especially the little fingers, so that's why it's very important that that it curved down near those silver keys on the side, that you know the C and the B. Um, but apart from that, well, let's let's make it complement the clarinet. I love the clarinet. I still remember when I first opened my clarinet and learnt the clarinet. I can still smell the cork grease. I love putting it together. I love that process of a clarinet. You know, it suits 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 my personality. So I thought, well, let's try to create some fun behind this product. So. What, what, what's a, a good way to connect this? So we went through it with the engineers um, and we came up with the magnet. So that means that the two magnetic bands can fit on the clarinet and they can stay on the clarinet. They look like, so the actual rubber band part of it is black. So, you know, most clarinets are you know, black or very dark at least. And the actual magnet on top, um, you can see the magnet and it looks like the keys of the clarinet. So it's a silver magnet. Um, and the guard is transparent as well. And you can just take the guard off, put it on your music stand via the magnets if you don't want to use it at that point and put it back on and take it off, um, et cetera. And the guard to be transparent so it's not, you know, it's not altering the look of the clarinet really um, with, with the aesthetics. Um, also, the way it cur- – I mean, obviously, it's hard for the listeners um, – Obviously, they can they can go to the website or uh, research it. Um, it flows from the top of the clarinet, and it actually, if you if you held the clarinet on its side, so um, um, horizontal, the guard scoops up from the barrel piece, and and, it, and it, it almost mirrors or matches what the A key is doing on the clarinet. Now, this was very specific as well. This was a design we looked at. Um, there's another issue with playing clarinet where a lot of people don't roll their left hand index finger to the A key. So they plop it back on, you know, they're using their, their, their fingerprint to, to go on the A key. And this is, this is quite problematic if you're trying to get over the break. If you're playing from an A and you're trying to go to a B, that's quite hard. So this is encouraging people to roll their finger as well to get to the A key. Um, and also there's a little little kick at the end of the classical fingers. That was my, my little idea there. And it just goes with what, what the bell would be doing. So the bell kicks off and so does classical fingers at the end. Um, and even if you held it looking down the shaft of the clarinet with the classical fingers and, and, the, and, the, and the side of classical fingers with those silver keys I was mentioning before, it's exactly in line. It's the same angle as those keys on the clarinet. So... I, I I love the look of it. You know, <laughs> I had yeah, a, no, it's yeah, um, it's definitely I, aesthetically pleasing. That's for sure. Oh uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I had a student 
this would have been priceless. I had a student two days ago. She's 12. She's just started. Um, and there was a, another student in the class um, who was just waiting for her lesson. And she suddenly saw classical fingers. I hadn't introduced it. So it's not the kind of thing I say, welcome to the lesson. Let's buy classical fingers and let's use it straight away. I go through a couple of weeks first and just gauging how their fingers are going and concentrate on the embouchure and a few things that are the very, very fundamentals, which are really important, of course. And she goes, what's that on your stand? And then the other student says, that's classical fingers. And she stood back and said, oh, my God, oh, my God, that's amazing. That's amazing. Oh, it looks amazing. Oh, I didn't know something like that existed. That would be so good. And I thought, oh, man, if I just if I just filmed that. <laughs> can, yeah, it's a commercial right again? there. <laughs> yeah, and, but for me, that's, that, and that, that's exactly what classical fingers is about. It's that excitement. It's about playing the clarinet, enjoying the clarinet, something that can help your fingers. So if you play better on the clarinet, you'll enjoy the clarinet better. So, yeah, look, it's exciting. And in the box, of course, getting onto that, um, very simple, shows what the product is. It's a white, firm box. Again, what I mentioned before was that I loved opening the case. I loved putting my, my clarinet together when I was younger. So I thought, well, why don't I have a really good box where people can put it back in? They can use the box for something else. You know, it's, it's all about the experience as well as the practicality of classical fingers and also the pouch inside. You can use it to clean your, clean the guard. You can clean little bits of your uh, classical fingers or just use it as a pencil case, you know? So yeah. yeah. Is this a microfiber? It is, yeah. It's so, microfiber. Right? Yeah. And, um, yeah. that's, it's kind of cool. That one's, I suppose, thinking about it more designed for the kids, you know, that kind of, uh, little sports bag kind of feel to it um and a lot of them use it for their pencils and pens anyway to come to lessons so you know it's multi-purpose and that's cool i really really so enjoy that mm. is this product designed then more um for the students to own and and bring to the lesson or is it something that a teacher would purchase and use as a studio tool um in my opinion the way i the way i started this project I would recommend it to be something you take home. So if a teacher wants to have one classical fingers for themselves in the lesson, of course, that's fantastic. That means the student doesn't necessarily need to bring their own classical fingers to the lesson. So the teacher, so the student would have their magnetic bands on their clarinet the whole time. So that's what my students do. And they can come along to the lesson. The teacher can just put it on and just double check how their fingers are going take it off so it's not designed to be there 24 7 but for the mm -hmm. student whether or not most students are over here usual time for a lesson is 30 minutes i suppose to an hour i always teach a minimum of 45 minutes try to go for an hour for most of my students but that's only an hour in a whole week so for me to create muscle memory for a student to have the correct muscle memory for me, I would say it's essential to have this product at home so the student can test and retest what their fingers are doing at home, play their scales with classical fingers on, and over time, over a couple of weeks, they will already start to notice that difference in their finger placement. And then the teacher can just double-check this. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's important for teachers to um, jump on board with this. I think it's a very important product. Um, because in my research and, and the people that have been contacting me who bought this uh, across different places in the world have said this is, this is really helpful to these students. And, and part, of what I'm, part of what I'm actually doing is it's not necessarily about, hey, I've got a product, I just want to sell it. I mean, of course, that's part of it so it can help people, but it's about creating awareness. And I, I, what I'm seeing is there's a lot of teachers who, depending where you're from, I don't want to stand on any toes mentioning this but you know they, they may not be aware of this as, as as an issue so they might be racking their brains trying to teach trying to teach and not really focusing on oh actually if your little fingers are, are standing up at right angles to your clarinet a this might not be good for your you know, finger placement <laughs> of course but, you know, that's not good for your hand. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've got a, uh, there's a physiotherapist I met, Randy Kurtz, in, in NAM this year. And um, great guy, really nice guy. And, and he came along and he said, well, yeah, this would make sense to alleviate that hand issue, especially if you're, you know, keeping your hands at the wrong angle. I mean, clarinets, 
Clarion is a bit of a nasty instrument for that anyway. Yeah. Um, for, for your fingers, you know, and I suffered from that. So going back right to the start of our conversation, that was huge for me. That, well, and honestly, that's potentially stopped me, um, you know, pursuing a professional clarinet career as a performer because I, I was just in pain. I, I'm, the physiotherapist couldn't do anything about it. I started perhaps with the wrong technique of really crunching my, my, my fingers at, when I started, you know, playing two hours a day as a 13-year-old. Um, you know, my, my little finger was up quite high as well. I remember that. So, you know, all of that's really important. And I'm very much passionate about that. So even if you don't buy classical fingers, at least – create that awareness that, hey, this is a bit of an issue going on and why not alleviate that issue so people can have, you know, an easier fluid motion on the clarinet. So so have you found in your travels that to be an issue? Like I think that it's pretty, uh, you know, from what I've encountered, people are already normally addressing the issue of finger heights as a rather um, rudimentary required mm-hmm. playing technique. I mean, I'd be surprised if it wasn't something that was addressed. It's Seems odd. Yeah. 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 Um, in my travels, absolutely. So especially over here in Australia and even New Zealand, a lot of teachers, again, I don't want to, it's a bit of a hard topic, but there's a lot of, well, in my opinion, there's, there's quite a few teachers I've met in my travels. Even when I've gone to these trade shows, I went to a trade show last year, Music Messe mm-hmm. in Germany. And, of course, people going to trade shows are going to be a bit more passionate, a bit more dedicated to what they're doing. But I ha- I've talked to a lot of teachers, and a lot of teachers have a concern about other teachers. <laughs> other teachers not really doing the job that they need to do as a teacher. So, again, this is I'm not trying to generalize, and this can happen, of course. So I've had a few students come to me after playing two years or more from other teachers, other teachers who do – group lessons so again i've got to be very careful about this which are fine within controlled environments and a similar level so group lessons can have good effects as a social social sort of uh, feeling for the students or or not so so i've had students come to me after two years and literally the teacher has not taught them how to tongue on the clarinet they've taught them the wrong fingering on the clarinet i've had flute teachers in schools teaching clarinet and they're teaching the wrong flow of breath for how you play the clarinet and that's very hard to uh, reverse those fundamentals Um, and I've had students come to me to learn the clarinet and I've found out that they're only learning the clarinet so they can quickly teach at school so the the other things that I've faced and I'm hoping with what you said it might not be so prevalent in places where where you associate with and obviously ICA for example all seem pretty professional people so that's why I'm part of that group and I respect everybody on that Mm -hmm. but there are other things going on a lot of students are having there's a lot of detrimental effects happening on students and what I've seen from from particular teachers um, but that's a big topic, and yeah, it's <laughs> there's, not much, we, <laughs> there's not much we can do about that. So, so to, you know. to using the device uh, for a student, are are they sort of trying to hit it as sort of sort of tactile feedback, no. or not to hit it? Look, the the first answer for that would be no. So it's acting as a deterrent to to. Okay, so you've got the awareness for classical fingers. So mm-hmm. okay, fine. My fingers shouldn't be going too high. Didn't realize my fingers were going too high. Great, classical fingers. Cool, that's step one. Then you've got, well, okay, I want to keep away from this guard as much as possible. I don't really want to touch it. So it allows your fingers to go a lot lower. But on the flip side of that, you can also use it as a reference point for yourself. So what I've noticed is, uh, especially in the right hand, when people are playing you know, your left hand C, D, E, et cetera, et cetera, the right hand starts cramping up. So your little finger on your right hand is, is heading up the clarinet away from those, the, the C and the, the silver keys at the bottom. And what I've told my students, at least, and people have been in contact over the internet, spread your hand out, you know, so they're above the holes. Very hard to, to, to stay by yourself. And you can actually use classical fingers as a reference point. So you can hit your fingers up against classical fingers for a while 
So it references where your fingers should be. And that would be part of that muscle memory. So hard to create muscle memory, in my opinion, without that feel as well. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I get some of my students to even play, this sounds funny, play a scale without their clarinet. So you're touching your fingers on your thumbs. And you can at least go through the motion of your fingers doing a scale. So I used to do that to learn my scales, for example. So by the time you go to your clarinet, your fingers are feeling a lot better and, and, and you remember where the, where the notes are. So especially with the little fingers. So if you hit them up against where the keys are, you, you, I've got some students who struggle remembering where their C, the D sharp, the C sharp and the B are on their right little finger, for example, and the alternative on the other side. And they're using classical fingers to raise their right finger or their left little finger to remember where that actual key is. And, and it sounds... Look, it sounds uh, – if, if, if you go back to when you first learned clarinet, and depending how talented people are, and as a teacher I see that more often, but if you go back to re- trying to remember that, you think, oh, yeah, actually that could have been a real issue. So quite often when we play clarinet – I mean, obviously I can play clarinet, you can play – but we sometimes forget that for a student starting, they might not – you know. They struggle with a few things on the clarinet and where the keys are. So, yes, you can push your fingers up against classical fingers for a reference point. But over time, the point is you use it as a deterrent and you try to play it without touching the guard. So I would say play a chromatic scale, play an E chromatic scale, three octaves if you're at that level, at that point, um, and see if you can play it without touching the guard. And a lot of students who are quite good, they can do it, and then suddenly up in the um, upper altissimo notes, they're starting to flick their left hand index finger up too high as well. So that'll affect them with playing the higher notes. Um, yeah, so that's where it's at at the moment <coughs> with classical fingers. So how's the feedback um, so been? You can use do, it for, do you have it being used with fellow teachers or on the, in your area? Absolutely. <clears throat> so we've got teachers, we've got the shops. Um, I've got people buying it online um, and they send me great feedback uh, via email and I've got students buying, I've got teachers buying, I've got university students who buy it um, via our online site. Um, and so, yeah, huge feedback. I had a lady saying, uh, thank you so much for Classical Fingers. This has alleviated my problem with my RSI, as you said before, repetitive strain injury for her right hand. So she obviously was cramping her hand up and it was too high. So you know, that makes it all worth it for me for this product. Um, another person said this was interesting. He was studying at UCLA, and he said his teacher didn't particularly think his fingers were too high, but the student wanted to, you know, he really wants to push himself as a professional clarinetist. So he bought it, and he thanked me for that and said, wow, I didn't realize, and I was a bit skeptical at first, because my teacher was saying, oh, there's nothing wrong with your fingers. And he said, my fingers have now gone far beyond what they were before. So for me, that's, that's huge. I mean, that really is the point of classical fingers. Is there any <laughs> thoughts for an adjustable version? Because like, I'll have to be honest, I, I, I tried it for about 30 minutes and I didn't hit it once. So I don't know if it's like, what is a surprise or something? <laughs> yeah, but, no, um... no, yeah, I got your message with that. And I always appreciate that, of course. I mean, this is a real product out there and a, a, people can give me feedback like that. Um, as far as height adjustable, yes, you can take the middle magnet out of the magnetic band and that lowers the, the guard. So do you um, kind of tuck it into the band then, or how does that absolutely. work? Absolutely. Yeah, you tuck it into the band then. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's how you'd, you'd um, alleviate that. Um, the issue is with to get height adjustable, that would just, on a practical term, would raise the price of classical fingers way too high. Mm. for doing that and to have such an engineered guard to achieve what it actually does so for people like yourself um not sure sean i'm not sure how large your hands are for example um but i've had students who adult students who need extra magnets for it to go higher oh wow yeah and for me to play it I'm sitting there with my fingers. So whatever photo there is on, on online of the person playing, that's my hand. And you can see they're very close to the 
you know, enough aeration from the keys to get a, a good sound, of course, because that's also important. So we didn't want it. So to answer your question before, you don't want it, <clears throat> excuse me, you don't want it too low because you have to have the aeration of the keys. So your fingers have to be a certain height off the keys. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to understand that. So we can't lower it too too low and say, hey, here's one, here's one for 10-year-olds and here's one for, you know, a person with really big hands who's, you know, an adult, for example. <clears throat> so you can lower it a little bit for, for people like yourself who, okay, I might need a lower. But again, Sean, you're obviously good well, as I'm, well. I'm, I'm, yeah, I was, I'm not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't want to. You may not need <laughs> classical fingers, you know, that's okay. Well, I was going <laughs> to say, don't I don't think that, myself. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that, like, that I'm really the target market, but. <laughs> no, hopefully not. But, um, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> that's but funny. For people who, yeah, so, who hmm, are using Karen. it though, I just would, I think it would be kind of interesting to be able to lower it. I'm just actually putting it back on my clarinet here right now to try this. Mm, mm, mm. I took out that uh, magnet, as you suggest there. That's uh, And I did. That's actually a great idea. I don't know why I didn't think of that myself. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. We're going to push that a bit more. And that is really good now, actually. That is that is taking it to a, a nice point. Yeah, that's interesting. And, it's different, um, isn't it? Yeah. It, it is. And that, that, that actually would be a place where you could remove it. And you know, let's say a student's getting a little better. You can actually... Oh, yeah, this is quite a bit closer. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really it's an interesting idea and it, it's funny because I think it's something that a lot of people have, you know, sort of thought of or dreamt of in some way, but is this mm. the first product really like this? I mean, what what caused you to bring it to reality when everyone else sort of never did? <laughs> um, yeah, great question. I mean, I, I ask myself that all the time. <laughs> it's, it's been a very long road. So, 3 years of development. It's been out there for 2 years. I've been pushing this product um including two trade shows overseas contacting people um i'm on ica so i try to create that awareness of course that's a hard one because people oh it's hard sean people are so skeptical about oh it's just a piece of plastic oh it's expensive i could just do this and everybody's allowed their opinion i always respect opinions um but you know at the end of the day i 100 percent believe in this product it is absolutely crucial for people who struggle with their fingers up high very very difficult for a person and a teacher to really control that for some students you know so for me that's what it's about and and even and i remember when i first you know had the first run and i brought them to my house because uh, that's how you start you know it's a it's very uh I have to have complete control over it so I know exactly what's going out every time and when I'm happy with it. And I just remember saying, well, look, if this can help one student, then for me that three years of research, the 10 years of teaching at that point is worth every second that I've put into this product because to see, to see somebody improve so much on the clarinet is absolutely huge for me. And to get feedback from different places around the world is huge for me. So um, and people may not realize that this is not some product I'm just trying to flog off quickly. This is, uh, this is here for the long term. I want this product around in 20 years' time, still helping people. I've had you know, an email from a person from Jakarta. Now, that's in Indonesia. Um, that's a long way from most places in the world. And he's used it. With, he bought it for his son. He wants his son to be a professional clarinetist. And it's really helped his fingers. You know, I've sold it to South Africa. I've sold it to China, Hong Kong, Japan, all these places. It's fantastic. You know, I even sold one to Russia. Uh, you know, there's so many people out there who can benefit from this product. And for me, that, that's, worth, that, that's worth everything for me because I teach. You know, I love teaching. I'm very passionate about what I do. And, and I see it firsthand with my students. And that, that's just that's an amazing feeling for me. To, to be able to create something that, you know, that, that particular guard, that particular product didn't exist. They, they used to have one <clears throat> which was just a, um, I think it was just a bar. I think it was a French design. I didn't know this actually before I made Classical Fingers. It was a French bar and it went across, went across the clarinet, but it didn't help your little fingers, etc. And they charged about $300 for it. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, Wow. My product is sitting at the moment about $66 US. So, you know, for me, that's around the, 
you know, just over maybe what a lesson costs. Um, and, you know, it's a great accessory to have, you know. And like I said, you know, if, if somebody thinks they can, you know, improve their finger placement without classical fingers, I think fantastic. That's just as good, you know, if, if they want. Um, and this just helps people. So, you know, I, I, that's probably my point of coming across, you know. It's a good product. I believe in it. A lot of people are using it. Um, it's, it's getting out there further into the world and people are really finding the benefits of it from being a, a young clarinet novice to people who are mid-range, grade five, grade six kind of level of, of the clarinet. So playing fairly well. But, you know, again, the fundamentals might not have been there from five years ago. And also adults and university students who really want to perfect their skills. Um, and uh, I think that's just really important to have that have that known, you know, right. and, and again, create awareness, you know. I do think it's interesting what you say about, you know, the cost of a lesson versus the product. And I, I wish that more people kind of thought that way, especially when it comes to a new mouthpiece or ligature and things like that. Absolutely. Or, you know, I, yeah, I, absolutely. I, it's yeah. amazing how many lessons can go by, you know, trying to fix something when really <laughs> the problem is like something that just needs to be replaced or fixed or. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Sean. That's, you know, the mouthpiece or, or, or the kind of read. Get a better ligature. Don't have the little metal ligature that comes with your four hundred dollar clarinet. You know that's a huge start. So for fifty dollars, you can grab a pretty good ligature, and your tonality starts sounding good. So again, like what you said, all these things add to the experience of playing the clarinet, enjoying the clarinet, because that's that's the point of music. That is the point of music. Well, I don't see any other point uh, absolutely <laughs> <than enjoying yeah. laughs> it as a human it's, it's innate it's it's a human it's a human right to enjoy music and if you can grab an instrument and play an instrument and get a great sound that's that's a real gift it really is you mentioned the uh, the skepticism and, and people wanting to try this, um, but uh, one mm. lucky clarinet, clarinet listener actually will be winning one of these. Um, what would you like to say to the person who wins this product? That's fantastic. Um, the person who wins this product, I would say congratulations, of course, and uh, thank you for uh, obviously following Clarinet. Um, great podcast, great uh, person um, who's pushing this, and, and um, I believe that Sean's passionate about what he's doing, and it's fantastic that you're supporting this and also supporting, supporting people like me who are trying to uh, push, the, push the boundaries of um, learning instruments and being a innovative about what we do and passionate about what we do so i'd like to say thank you and also congratulations and and i hope um this is all that you that you um uh, believe it will be and it will help you of course <laughs> yeah and as yeah. we mentioned i think this would be useful for any person i mean if you're a student obviously this is great if you're a professional player you probably have students or if you're you know if a parent of a clarinet student or know someone who is this is going to be something kind of cool to, to pass along so for a chance to win, make sure you subscribe to the Clarinet email list at www.clarinet.com and uh, fill in your email address on the sidebar. And that'll give you access to not only uh, win this and other offers in the future, but also exclusive coupons and uh, other um, content updates to your inbox. So great, Phil. That's, that's awesome. So that's how people can potentially win one of these. But of course, there's only one winner and probably many people who are, <laughs> are interested. Where can we find you online? Yeah, um, that's just as easy as going to classicalfingers.com. And also there's a little contact page. So if you've got any further questions, you can ask me or you can um, focus your questions to Sean as well. I'm sure he'd be happy to help. And um, yeah, it'd be, be really good to hear from people. That's great. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast today, Phil. Oh, you're welcome. It's been a pleasure. And uh, uh, thank you for considering me. And that's all for today's episode of the Clarinet.com podcast. If you want to learn more about the product that we mentioned on today's show called Classical Fingers or Phil Lambert's company, Cloudbreak Music, go to www.clarinet.com and search episode 24 in the search bar. To make sure you're eligible to win this and other items mentioned on the podcast, sign up for Clarinet's mailing list, enter your email on the sidebar or click giveaways at the top of the page. If you find that you're enjoying the podcast, please consider telling a friend, student, colleague, or family member who might be interested in it about it. You can also leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher or whichever other app you happen to use, and you can support the show directly by purchasing products at the clarinet.com online store. See www.clarinet.com slash store. This episode was brought to you by Daddario Woodwinds.
Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, D'Addario is redefining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with technology built from the ground up. By using the world's most innovative techniques to deliver consistently what was once made variable by hand, D'Addario ensures excellence right out of the box as standard, not a surprise. So you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from D'Addario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com woodwinds.